Hello, and welcome to Tools Tuesday here on Answer Everywhere. Today, we're taking a look at the Envoy proxy, which is a uh, it, kind of a part of a service mesh sort of offering um, that's often used in conjunction with things like Kubernetes, often as a sidecar proxy. Um, it's a cool program. I just uh, I saw a um, a nice technical talk on it on YouTube. I'll throw that in the um, in the show notes. But uh, other than that, we're just going to jump into the code as usual. So here's their GitHub. And uh, actually, hang on. Here's their GitHub. Uh, it's mostly uh, C++, I expect, C++. There's some Starlock in there. Um, they use some of the, the Google tooling. For example, we have Basil here uh, for the build system. I think they used gRPC for some of the uh, RPC stuff. And then there's Java, and who knows what Java is for. Starlark is for the build system, I, I imagine. OK. So I've used Envoy. Um, or mostly I've used things that uh, were built upon Envoy, and uh, but I don't have a good sense of how how it works, how how the code is laid out. So uh, I'm not really sure where to start. Um, test might be interesting in this case, and the Envoy directory is definitely going to be interesting. Uh, we have API which I guess I'm going to ignore. I'm guessing this is essentially like the front end API. Um, and actually, maybe before we get too deep, let's remind ourselves of well, or uh, remind ourselves or learn for the first time um, what Envoy proxy is about. Let's see if I can pull up an architecture diagram. I'm not sure any of these looks especially, um, especially exciting. Um, I'm not. Maybe let's try the Wikipedia. We get lots of stuff, lots of service mesh stuff, and that's an important application of Envoy. But kind of what I'm looking for is just the just the architecture of the proxy itself. And uh, my understanding is that oh, we don't get much here on Wikipedia. It's going to do a lot of, um, I think, uh, L3, uh, L4 type stuff. Um, there's going to be a lot of stuff um, at the byte level. It'll handle some sockets. There's going to be lots of, uh, the, a co there's a common filter chain pattern whereas you get some connection in, um, you do processing in these sort of filter objects and the, the, the requests or the connections or whatever kind of uh, run the gauntlet through these filters and the filters change various things. Then there's going to be filters at the byte level. Um, and then there's also going to be filters at the HTTP level as well. Um, but I think... Envoy is general enough that the HTTP stuff is is sort of a layer up from the from the real guts of the project. And let me just double check that I that YouTube knows what I'm doing. <clears throat> All right, so what I would like to do is I would like to see the the guts. They have some kind of interesting logic to handle um, uh, to handle not dropping connections if you restart Envoy. And based on the talk I just looked at, it looks like what they do is they have two processes that share some data, and mostly what they share is 
uh, statistics metrics for the most part. But if one of the processes is going down, it can send essentially over RPC um, the sockets that it's that it, that are currently connected to it. So it can hand those off to the other process, which I suppose is not going down, and that process will take over. Um, so I, I would kind of like to see that. I've never really seen anything like that before, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what we'll find. We might find stuff that's that's more interesting than that as well. So here's some tests. Uh, we've got some listener tests, a main, some protocol buffers, presumably. Test mocks, integration tests, fuzzing, extensions. So Envoy should be very extensible. Um, config and, and benchmark tests. Okay. Should we look at uh, test listener? Look at the test listener CC file. And and also the, the proto directory. And maybe one, one more thing I should mention is that a lot of the stuff that service meshes are doing um, is increasingly being pushed down um, out of these sidecar proxies into the kernel um, through eBPF, which we did a video on last week. Um, you can go look at that. Uh, there will still continue to be a need for, for sidecars because service mesh stuff is just kind of one thing that, that sidecars do. And if you're not familiar with a sidecar, you can basically think of it as uh, a buddy application. So in a microservices environment, a thing like Kubernetes, often what will happen is you have um, each team will like own a microservice. And this microservice might be written in the team's favorite language. It might be written in Go or Python or Rust or Scala or whatever the, the company is doing. But then there's um, a bunch of logic that cuts across all the teams. And that will be that will that will vary depending on what the what company it is uh, that's that that's organizing this um, th that owns these microservices. But that might be things like um, common billing information. That might include things like um, information about who's who's sending the request. So perhaps authentication or authorization stuff. Um, it might include things like common common rate limiting stuff. And some of that might be pushed uh, into the kernel with eBPF, but a bunch of it is, is really just application logic that just, you just don't want every microservice to, to, um, to have to repeat the same stuff. So um, you, you know, just like you do when you're, when you're writing a, a web service or whatever, and you want to ignore, uh, you want to ignore like TLS. And so you just, you know, have an insecure port open and then you put that port behind um, like a reverse proxy or something. The same sort of principle where you can simplify the, the um, you can simplify the, the microservice considerably and then just have this other sidecar that's owned by some other team. Um, and then all the, all the kind of complicated fiddly stuff that, that might have otherwise gone into your like main function just goes into that sidecar. Hi, hi, Daniel. How's it going? Um, and then here in the Envoy test protos, we have, um, these are just testing things like bookstore is a common testing uh, protocol buffer that I recognize from tutorials. Um, hello world is an obvious, uh, obvious testing thing. So I'm going to ignore these. And then we have test listener. I'm not sure if this is listening to tests or it's testing a listener object but it seems to mainly be, it doesn't seem to be importing any, anything interesting. So I guess I'll ignore it. All right, let's look at um, Envoy slash Envoy. Again, we have API, which is different from the Envoy, from the API folder that's uh, under main directly. Common, common might be important. Buffer could be a uh, very low level, possibly. Compression. I think I will ignore config, not sure. Event, this should be like a pretty key event loop. So maybe event is where that is. Filter will be important. Uh, GRPC and HTTP, maybe. I might close this pretty quickly. Init, who knows, um, local info. 
that could be interesting. Matcher, I'm going to guess is for like matching filters. I think, yeah, I'll, I'll look at it. Network, protobuf, I guess all the things. RDS, something discovery service. You know, I'm going to open a bunch of these. I'm going to even open rate limit. And I guess I'll just try to go through these directories quickly to do a first pass um, and then see what I see there that is um, that looks important. So I'm going to ignore secret, I think. They do have some interesting TLS stuff, but um, I guess I'll just really, I'm just opening everything. TCP, thread, thread local. I'll ignore tracing. <laughs> How's that? And upstream. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Um, so in common, we have things like callbacks. So I guess some callback implementation, connection pools, exceptions, hashables, platform, I guess platform specific stuff, pure, Is this like pure functions. Pure, friendly name for a pure virtual routine. Okay. Yeah, so that's like pure functions. So these, this common, it seems like a utility, um, a utility folder. I guess let's look quickly at token bucket. This class defines an interface for the token bucket algorithm. And then we've got a link to the Wikipedia article on token buckets. The so token buckets are like you can consume tokens and spend tokens. Um, I guess let's look at the Wikipedia article. The token bucket is an algorithm used in packet switched and telecommunication networks. Um, based on an analogy of a fixed capacity bucket in which tokens normally representing a unit of bytes or a single packet of predetermined size are added at a fixed rate. When a packet is to be checked for conformance to the defined limit, the bucket is inspected to see if it contains sufficient tokens at that time. If so, the appropriate number of tokens, for example, equivalent to the length of the packet in bytes are removed or cached in and the packet is passed, for example, for transmission. The packet does not conform if there are insufficient tokens in the bucket, and the contents of the bucket are not changed. Non-conforming packets can be treated in various ways. They might be dropped. They might be enqueued for subsequent transmission when sufficient tokens have been accumulated. Or they may be transmitted but marked as being non-conformant. Um, and so you add tokens to the bucket at a kind of at a fixed rate, and then there's the bucket has some capacity. And it's a way of um, I mean, I guess you might call it rate limiting, but it's a way of uh, allowing, um, of managing the flow of things. So um, that's, token buckets are interesting, but I'll, I'll plow along. Here's buffer, envoy buffer. We just get a buffer header. I don't know where the C files are. I think I've so far seen mostly headers. Uh, so a buffer, we have a raw slice, which is a raw memory data slice, including location and length. And slice data, buffer memory. Okay, so this is some, uh, I guess, optimized buffer, um, which, has, which has things like drains. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Schrodinger. How goes it? All right, um, and then we have events. Event has, let's see, deferrable, deletable, dispatcher, dispatcher, thread, deletable. I think this is gonna be important. Maybe I'll make like an important window here. This will be my um, things that have passed, test one, pass one. Filter, we just get um, the header. There must be a filter.c though. Um, Filter config provider manager. I don't think that's so interesting. I'm sure we'll run into filters again. gRPC is the async client. Some credential stuff and a status. Status and context, which I'm guessing are just from the gRPC library. 
Um, what is async client doing? Async request, raw async stream, raw async client. We've got the send raw thing. Start a gRPC unary RPC asynchronously. It seems like they're implementing their own um, gRPC thingy. I'm not sure if this is like a lightweight and in-flight unary G gRPC. I don't know why they're not using um, regular gRPC. Maybe uh, I think they're using it possibly for the um, inter-process communication. So maybe this is like a lighter weight version. HTTP has things like connection pools, an async client, an API listener, a header map, protocol.h, stateful session. And we're just really just the header files. Init has things like manager, target, and watcher. What's watcher going to do? A watcher handle functions as a weak reference to a watcher. Okay. A watcher is an entity that listens for notifications that either an initialization target or all targets registered with the manager have initialized. So it's checking whether things have initialized. Hmm. Local info, again, not much. Local info dot h. I guess let's look at the header real quick, since we're here anyway. But I'm just curious what sort of stuff is here. We have stuff about zones, information about the local environment. What does local mean in this context? Is like the machine, node name, cluster name, context provider. I think this is stuff about the node in the sense of the machine. Matcher should be just matching, matching stuff. Describes a match tree, which traverses the tree, a tree until it either matches resulting in either an action or a new tree to traverse, or it doesn't match. So this looks important. I'll put this in the um, important window. Network has things like address, exception, drain decision, DNS support, filter.h. Is this the real filter? Filter status, filter callbacks, write filter. Okay, so this looks important. I'll add this to the, to the important tab or important window. Message validator, protobuf, I am going to ignore. RDS, root config provider. Provider for constant route configurations. Mm. I guess that's interesting, but there's so little here that I think we can figure out from context if we run into it. Registry.h. We have a factory registry proxy. It's a proxy object that provides access to the static methods of a strongly typed factory registry. Uh, this doesn't look so interesting, but it might be fairly central because there's a, an actual implementation here for the first time. <laughs> Most of the stuff we've seen has no real implementation. So here's rate limit. Uh, this probably is just rate limiting. Uh, rate limit override. And we get we have token bucket rate limiting. Yeah, that's the that's the weight. That's the word I think I was looking for. Single uh, rate limit request descriptor, descriptor producer. Um, I guess I'll ignore this. I think there's going to be a bunch of interesting stuff. So I'm being pretty aggressive about ignoring stuff. Runtime might be really important. We have a snapshot, runtime feature enabled, feature enabled. So this is looking at features. Um, loading loads runtime snapshots from storage and loader uh, loader singleton to make runtime generally accessible we make use of the dreaded singleton the dreaded singleton class <laughs> for envoy the runtime will be created and cleaned up by the whatever class okay and then server in server we have things like filter config config trapper hot restart yeah this is definitely important Did that succeed or fail? Singleton, 
They called singletons dreaded, so I'm just going to guess this is a standard singleton, and they're not doing anything interesting with it. Um, so SSL, we have connection, context, contact, context, config, handshaker. This just looks like standard SSL stuff. Nothing, nothing especially fancy. Stats. Um, these are going to be things for writing metrics. I guess I'll ignore. Stream info. Yeah, I guess I'll I'll add stream of info. TCP, we have a connection pool, async TCP client in upstream. That's not so fascinating. I'll ignore it. Thread.h could be interesting. Um, we have a thread factory. We can create a thread. Create a thread immediately starting the thread the thread routine. And we have options. We can join a thread, block until the thread exits. Okay, that's a thread. I mean, the, its API is simple enough. I think that we can um, that we can understand it from context if we run into it again. And then we have a thread local. And this I'm already seeing that has the TLS slot stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna. I think that's probably interesting enough. But then this raises the question of where where are the C files? So let's see if we can find um, some C files. Uh, so what's a header? How about filter.c? Okay. So source. Should I be looking in source? Sounds like I should be looking in source. Yep. Okay. A lot of people call it SRS, so I think I just my eyes glossed over it. It wasn't called SRS. Okay, and then and then in source we have so where where was this filter stuff? Um, source extensions filters. So these are examples of filters. Why do I just go into in source and run tree? All uh, right. So we see some interesting stuff like hot restart implementation here. Guard dog drain. So here's all the good stuff. It's under server, which is not so surprising. You've got some WebAssembly stuff, WebAssembly runtime, which somehow has a V8 folder. V8 presumably being the JavaScript, the Google JavaScript runtime thing. And then um, a lot of this other stuff, I'm not sure if it's important, but what directory is this in? Up, up, up. Can I output the, let's see, here's an important question. Can I pipe three into graph is? Hmm. It doesn't seem to be a whole lot there. Maybe I can um, do a call tree with less. Or maybe I can just do this, right? Okay, so there's lots of stuff in extensions. Um, okay, so a lot of stuff is, is not in the core, I'm guessing. Um, but we do have a lot of stuff in server. So let's look in server. Um, and I guess just for... Just for fun, let's look in server inside Emacs. Source server. Uh, okay. And all this stuff is just in the uh, just in the main directory. So marking wasn't working yesterday, but it seems like marking is working now. Okay, so we definitely want to see heart, hot restart implementation in header. Maybe hot restarting base, child, parent, all the hot, hot restart stuff. Admin, do we want to see the admin? Prometheus stats, listeners handler. 
I guess let's look at listeners handler. That's request runtime handler. Server command handler. Server info handler. And I guess let's just look at admin.h. I don't know if it's going to remember all of my marks, is it? Okay. Uh, let's look at the drain manager stuff. I have no idea what guard dog is, but it's got an impl, which might mean it's important. Listener hooks. And I guess let's also look at the hot restart proto. Statistics, I'm going to think of as um, something that's not central. We have server.h, server.cc, transport socket config, utils, watchdog implementation. And let's look at the worker implementation. I think that will be um, a lot. I guess cluster manager and server. Oh, no, this is validation. No, I don't care about, I don't care about validation right now. Uh, but did we see cluster stuff here? Huh. Uh, let's try uh, just grabbing for, no, let's try um, finding things that uh, have cluster in the name. Lots of things have cluster in the name. I don't care about API uh, for right now, but under, so config cluster, we have a cluster proto. Can I mark this? Um, data cluster extensions clusters. Envoy service cluster. And then source common upstream cluster discovery manager. Oopsie. So it might be that the cluster stuff is mainly in extensions. But we'll we'll take we'll poke around. Okay. So now how do we want to do this? I don't know. Let's look at the headers I open in the browser first. And here so here we are in network. I guess we'll look at socket, since we've looked at Linux sockets before. We'll look at listener header um, and the filter header. And I guess connection and connection handler. And that's all for the headers. Um, here's events. Let's look at um, the dispatcher header. Maybe the deferred stuff and the, 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 the dispatcher deletable thing. Scaled range time manager. I don't know. I guess we'll look at those things quickly. Here's master.h. Let's put master.h over here with the rest of the headers. Can I move to the to the end? All right. All right, so back back here. Stream info. I guess let's look at filter state and stream info. Here's thread local, which I will move to the end as well. And then server, we're going to look at a bunch of the um, C uh, implementation files for server, but I guess let's look at the hot restart header. Um, I guess we'll look at the watchdog header and the worker header, and maybe some of these headers will, will tell us that we don't really need to look at the implementation. Um, guard dog, I guess is different from watchdog, the drain manager header and the admin header. I guess that's good. Did I open hot restart? I'm not sure. I'll open it again. Registry.h, socket.h. Are we in header land? I think we're out of folders. Okay. Let's 
let's just look at some of these headers. Um, use registry. I'm not sure really what we're registering. Uh, maybe like backends or something. Uh, factory registry is a proxy object that provides access to the static methods of a strongly typed factory registry. So we've got this class, factory registry. We can, I guess we've got things like all the registered names. Uh, what sort of behavior do we have? We have some implementation. It's just got some vectors of app sale string view. So, so Envoy proxy uh, was created at Lyft, but there, um, these, it must have had some ex Google engineers because they're using Absale, they're using gRPC, they're using Basil. So, whatever they're doing, there's some um, Google y stuff in here. Uh, base factory category registry, factory category registry. I still don't know where we're registering. Here we go general registry for implementation factories. We're registering implementation factories, maybe. Is that right? I thought we were a factory for registries. But maybe we're a registry for factories. The registry is templated by the base class that this, that a set of factories conforms to. Okay, so the factories um, perform are part of some base class. They extend some base class, and the registry is some templated function here, a class base. It's a template. Classes are found by name, so a single name cannot be registered twice for the same base class. Note, class, this class is not thread safe, so registration should only occur in a single threaded environment, which is guaranteed by the static instantiation mentioned above. Okay, so we're going to register factories. I'm not sure what a factory is used for in the in Envoy. Um, allow factory injection only in tests. Vendor specific version of a factory. So I guess this is. Uh, I'm wondering if this is kind of uh, just supporting like the pluggable, extensible nature of Envoy, allowing allowing you to essentially have dependencies that are that that are not quite dependency injected in the um, in the Java sense, but doing the same sort of thing uh, is what I'm going to guess is is really what that's up to ultimately. Here's socket.h. Uh, should be some sort of socket stuff. We have socket options. Um, interfaces for providing a socket's various addresses. Can we turn the downstream SSL connection? You can turn a JA3 fingerprint half of the downstream connection. Um, connection info setter, so we can set connection info. So this, I guess that's largely for like, um, we're not handling sockets directly. I guess we've got these IO handle things. Do we have any actual sockets? Are we importing socket? We're getting like shared pointers and o, uh, o streams and IO thingamajigs. So I don't think we're dealing directly with sockets, at least not at this level. Well, we do have a socket class, and it's either a stream or a datagram. And we can get an IO handle for the underlying connection. And we can duplicate a socket. We can get its type. We can close it. We can check if it's open. We can bind an address to it, bind a socket, to, or bind it vice versa bind the socket to the address, bind a socket to this address. The socket should have been created with a call to socket. Okay. And we can listen on the bounded socket, the bound socket. We can connect the socket to this address. We've got this ioctal thing. Okay. You know, sockets. Are you primarily, uh, hi, Karen. Um, that's a good question. I think uh, in terms of like, yeah, I uh, yeah, I guess I guess mainly. I don't <laughs> I don't think of myself that way. I've written lots of C plus plus. I've written lots of Java. Um, I've written uh, smaller um, programs 
in in Python and Go and a bunch of other languages. I don't think that I guess I don't really think of myself as having a home language though. And the C plus plus I wrote was mainly at Google, and they have kind of their own their own flavor. Um, so all of this is pretty uh, sensible to me because they're using a bunch of the Google stuff, including not only the libraries but also like idioms. Like they're not doing uh, like if we looked at the kernel code that that's uh, like C rather than C plus plus, but the kernel folks do things like go tos that are, you know, out you know in the outside world a lot of people don't do that and there's similar stuff in C plus plus like the the Google uses a pretty restricted set and then the those restrictions are um, made. Uh, um, made up for by like having really nice libraries. And so there's, a, there's just kind of a different flavor. Um, okay, so what is this? We have, we have listener. So listener has this listen fo socket factory. It's a member of listen config to provide listen socket. So listen config, there's some config you can write probably in YAML if I remember correctly. Um, that will configure the behavior of, of Envoy. And so uh, we saw some of the socket stuff, and I guess that at some point there will be something that parses the config and sets the options. Um, but maybe I should say like a, in a project like Envoy, um, there's a real sense in which the most interesting thing is not necessarily what the code is doing. The real, um, the real interesting thing is like the design decisions that they made. And so, like you could read the, you could probably read the code all day and not realize how, um, why those were good design decisions, or like how other people have been doing it a different way for a long time and stuff like that. So um, I'm kind of imagining as I'm going through this that a lot of the code won't look especially interesting, but that's because the more interesting thing would be like the design document or, or the the architecture talk that that explains why things are the way they are. That's not true of every project, but that that's kind of the feeling I get with with um, Envoy, I think. But in the listener, we have um, we configure a UDP listener, that sort of stuff. Okay, and bind. All right. So filter. I just kind of want to know like what is what's in a filter. So we can continue and we can stop iteration. That's the filter status. Are we in filter status or filter? We're in filter. Um. So status codes are returned by filters that can cause future filters to not get iterated to. So normally you would do this with a Boolean. True would mean, I guess that varies project by project, right? But true often means like keep filtering. Uh, or in some cases, true means I've handled this and you don't need to keep applying filters. But um, I think that I think that this makes this is much nicer for programmers to not have to remember whether true means stop or true means go. You just have a, an actual enum. Then we have callbacks for individual filter in instances to communicate with the filter manager. So there's some filter manager. I don't think we've seen it yet, um, but it's going to manage filters, I suppose. It could be just mainly a container that has all the filters and send you know, like routes data through them. We have uh, uh, callbacks including this connection, which is pure, and the sock and socket, which is pure. This will return the connection that owns the filter, and socket will return the socket. Return socket, the socket the filter is operating on. This might be a typo. I think it's just supposed to say this returns the socket, return the socket without this extra big socket here. Okay, so then we have callbacks for things like uh, for in individual write filter instances to communicate with the filter manager. I'm not sure what a write filter is, but presumably a filter that like writes stuff, like you might um, rewrite uh, information about the connection or in the headers. Uh, inject write data to filter chain, which will take some data and end stream as a Boolean, pass data directly to subsequent filters in the filter chain. This method is used in advanced cases in which a filter needs to, needs full control over how subsequent filters view data. Using this method allows a filter to buffer data or not, and then periodically inject data to subsequent filters, indicating end stream at an appropriate time. This can be used to implement rate, implement rate limiting, periodic data emission, etc. When using this callback, filters should generally move past 
in buffer and return filter status stop iteration. Okay, so data supplies the right data to be propagated directly to further filters in the filter chain. I don't know what this means. So like, is there data that's sent to everything? And we're going to somehow bundle up this with the rest of that data in, in some container. I don't know. And then end stream supplies the end stream status to be propagated. And it's just a Boolean. Okay. And a write filter is a write path binary connection filter. A write path binary connection filter. I don't know what path is here. It's doing here. But um, we have an on write callback, which will return a filter status. Called when data is to be written on the connection. Data supplies the buffer to be written, which may be modified. End stream supplies whether this is the last byte to write on the connection. Okay. And then we can initialize write filter callbacks, which initializes write uh, filter callbacks to interact with the filter manager. It will be called in the filter manager by the filter manager a single time when the filter is first registered. Okay. And we've got some callbacks for read filters, which are like the uh, dual of write filters, I suppose. They read things instead of writing them. Okay. We can inject read data into the filter chain. Hmm. Then a, a filter, I guess, is basically either a write filter or a read filter. A combination read and write filter. Uh, this allows a single filter instance to cover both read and write paths. Oh, maybe by paths, they mean um, as they're doing filtering, writes go through one code path or whatever, and then reads go through some other code path. And here's the filter manager in interface for adding individual network filters to a manager. You can add a write filter, add filter, add read filter, etc. initialize read filters. Then we get a factory, a filter factory CV, which is used to wrap the connection of a network filter chain for new connections as they come in. Filter factories create the Lambda at configuration initialization time, and then they are used at runtime. Okay, so configuration initialization, I guess whenever you pass it the config, which might be at startup, because I don't think it's at compile time, um, so maybe it first reads some config, does some jiggle some stuff around, and then it starts processing connections, which is maybe what they mean by runtime. And then we have some more callbacks. And a listener filter matcher, which has matches and takes a callback and returns bool. And I guess if you, why a callback? Maybe the callback is, is the match function. What is filter used for? So filter is used for uh, filtering things. So my understanding of the way Envoy works is it's like, it's, it's all filters. So um, everything you would want to do with a, um, a stream of, of bytes from some connection is going to pass through some filter. So maybe we can find, um, you know what, this is a good question for the AI assistants. Just to give us a, um, so what, just to give us some examples, I'll ask Bard what are, what's, what are some of its favorite um, Envoy filters? What are some of your favorite Envoy filters, proxy filters? So Bard has some favorites, such as the rate limit filter, which can be used to limit the number of requests that can be made to a service per second. This is useful for preventing denial of service attacks. The authentication filter, which is used to authenticate requests before they are forwarded to a service. Um, and I think with authentication, you can actually like leave, you can, you can make the request essentially leave the Envoy proxy and go to some other authentication service if you need to. I, I think you can make requests like that. Um, authorization filter, this filter can be used to authorize requests. Logging filter to log requests and tracing filter 
This filter can be used to trace requests and responses as they pass through Envoy. So let's ask it, um, which Envoy filter is the absolute worst? The worst Envoy filter is the one that you don't use. All right. Every filter has its own purpose. All right, I'll ask which is the most funny. Hilarious. I think the most hilarious Envoy proxy filter is the header filter. This filter can be used to add, modify, and re or remove headers from requests and responses. This can be useful for a variety of purposes, such as adding security headers. You can use it for more lighthearted purposes. For example, you could use it to add a funny message to every request that goes through your proxy. Or you could use it to change the user agent string so that it looks like you're coming from a different browser. OK. Um, can you write me a funny message to add to all of my headers? <laughs> all right, let's try, let's try it. Let's see what it says. Um, so. Bard is suggesting that we add, I'm not a robot. I'm just a human who is really good at clicking on things. This request is brought to you by the letter Q and the number 17. I'm not sure what I'm doing, but I'm giving it my best shot. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be here. <laughs> and I'm just a visitor. Don't mind me. These are a few ideas, so feel free to get creative. Yeah, so somebody should add these to uh... <laughs> Bard likes scary stuff. <laughs> yeah. This is good. I mean, somebody should add these to their, um, to all their internal headers. Okay. Um, all right. So, th so that's what a filter, that's what a filter is. It's basically, um, everything. It's just the kind of the data structure or the, or the metaphor that they use for processing, doing any sort of processing to the streams as they're coming or going. You can think of the streams as kind of like going along a conveyor belt and, and people are like, People are, or workers are like operating on them. And anything you do, um, I think is, is probably a filter. Okay. So, and then we have filter chains, which should be some chain of filters. You know what you were, somebody was asking about C++, I guess, Karen, Karen, um, and, uh, this, this, this style of C++ actually looks a bit like Java to me. And uh, I know Java gets a bad rap, but I think it's actually like not a bad language. I really didn't like it when I was writing Java, but now that I've written a ton of other languages, I feel like there are some things that um, that, that Java um, that Java did well in its day. I mean, it's kind of outdated, and they've been trying to catch up with like functional language stuff. And I haven't written in years, so I don't know what it's like now. But um, but I think you know. I think it had it, it, it had its reasons and it's super easy. The tooling is really great because it's so verbose. So like, you know, everyone complains about the verbosity of Java. But um you know, at least at the time the 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 tooling was was better than a lot of other languages. For example, languages that have undefined behavior or or runtime types. Um and then we've got some whatever this matching data thing is, which has a name. It says return network, I guess that's the default. In the uh, are we still in the matching data? We have socket and filter state and dynamic metadata and stuff. Bard is <laughs> sorry to Gen One. I I think I'm on the beta. Uh, I I had to be invited to Bard, which um, I did just because uh, it's it's a Google thing and people I know at Google um, probably um, uh, worked on it. So um, I'm sure it will. <laughs> It'll become public at some point soon. Okay, so here's um, here's Envoy. Oh, sorry, here's connection.h. And I'm guessing it's not so so interesting. So remote close, local close. So this is just kind of um, connection stuff, it looks like, but um, a nicer interface than what we saw when we looked at like the, the Linux kernel TCP stuff or the Linux kernel socket stuff. Uh, but we've got callbacks for things like uh, register for callback every time bytes are written to the underlying transport socket. And um, we've got half-closed semantics. 
Reading a remote half close will not fully close the connection. Okay. Cool. Um, connection handler. I'm not sure if this will be interesting. But it will keep track of, I guess, metrics like the number of connections. You can decrement the number of decrement the number of connections. You can add a listener. Okay, so adds a listener to the handler, optionally replacing the existing listener. So um, you, I guess, you'd have an optional overridden listener, a config for the listener. I guess you want to add, and a runtime loader. The runtime for the server. I'm not really sure what this runtime thing is doing, but it's a pure function. So I'm guessing um, the pure means, among other things, that um, the add listener doesn't have any like kind of like internal state that monkeys around with the, around with the function. So that's probably why you need to pass in the runtime explicitly. Functional program. So uh, Karen is saying um, functional programming sucks in Java, and <laughs> it has created wrapper for everything you need to do with lambdas. Huh. I'm not surprised functional programming sucks in Java. Um, I guess I'm a little bit surprised. It, well, yeah, yeah. I bet it's not, I bet it's ugly to use, but it might be, you know, reasonable. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not surprised. Java is definitely clunky. I guess maybe one way of saying like what I what you know what I was saying about how how I've like warmed up to Java's virtues is that one thing you notice I think is that um, programming languages often invite you to write sort different sorts of programs, and um, aside from having long variable names, I think Java programs you know they tend to be they tend to be written um, reasonably compared to, to <laughs> compared to some other languages. I mean, you can always like, you can always architect things well in any language, but it seems like for whatever reason, um, maybe just because the people who learned Java are like corporate people. And so they write kind of tidier code, but that's, that's kind of one thing I've noticed, um, is that it, it does a, a pretty good job at its niche. Um, that's not to say I love it, but, um, I guess I'm kind of feeling lately that, uh, I haven't found found like the programming language that really speaks to me. Um, and so and so most things I look at, um, I feel like I feel like there are things that that aren't aren't quite right. But I'm also trying to see the um the best in things as well. Okay, so we can remove the filter change. We can stop listeners. We can disable listeners. All right. Uh, pause listening, active listener, <laughs> used by connection handler to manage listeners. So I guess um, we can uh, turn off listeners, turn them on, add them, remove them, those sorts of things. In dispatcher, what's in dispatcher? Dispatcher base, minimal interface for the dispatching loop. Dispatching loop used to create low level primitives. See dispatcher below for the full interface. So we can post, post a functor, post a functor to the dispatcher. This is save cross thread. The functor runs in the context of the dispatcher event loop, which may be on a different thread than the caller. And then we have is thread safe validates that an operation is thread safe. Well, I kind of forget what a functor is in C. Functors in C++. A function object? What are C++ functors? A functor is a class or a struct object which can be called like a function. Okay, so... so okay, fun, in, uh, I guess uh, um, an object that can be called. And so it's essentially a callback. We have a scope track, which is a minimal interface to support scope tracked objects. We've got these push and pop operations. Maybe this, maybe it's keeping track of scope through a stack. 
seems like. Here's Dispatcher, which extends Dispatcher Base and Scope Tracker. And it can do things like create a file event, create a timer, create a scale timer, allocates a scale timer. See timer docs for how to use the timer. Okay. And we have, we can initialize stats. We can create a server connection, wraps an already accepted socket in an instance of Envoy's server network connection. Okay. So this kind of promotes a socket to a server connection object thingy. We can create a connect a client connection. We can create a listener, creates a listener on a specific port, and you give it a socket a callback, a TCP listener callback specifically. You give it the runtime, uh, whether to bind to the port, whether to ignore the global connection limit, and it's a pure function. Hmm. And run type runs. So hmm, runs the event loop. This will not return until exit is called either from within the callback or from a different thread. So oh, first we get this enum, which is block, non-block, or run until exit. And then we have the, it runs as a virtual function and you pass in a type. Okay. And they ha they have, have I tried Rust? I haven't programmed anything in Rust. Um, I have done... Uh, no, I haven't tried Rust. I am planning to use Rust for low-level stuff. I'm pretty convinced that I'm going to like Rust. I just haven't made anything with it. I've read, like, I read the Rust book. Um, I've done some programming exercises in Rust, but that, but that's really it. I do really like C++, but it seems like Rust makes slightly better trade-offs than C++. Um, and I think to do C++ well, you have to be very... Um, it seems like it's easy for uh, programmers to add things in C++ that that break um, break your assumptions, um, and those can be hard to catch unless you're really uh, fastidious about things. And I think my impression is that Rust is better at that, and Rust seems to have a, a nicer type system, which is something I care about. Um, I haven't. Have you? Is it? Um, have you tried? Have you uh, have you worked in Rust? Defer, deferred deletable is not maybe so interesting. This thread deletable, the at least the header is not interesting. A schedulable callback. Um, I guess you can directly schedule it. I guess you give it a clock. Maybe a timer. Schedule a callback so it runs on the current iteration of the event loop after all events scheduled in the current event loop have had a chance to execute. So you just ask it to run when it's done with its current stuff. We have a scaled timer. I'm just curious about why it's scaled. It describes a minimum a minimum timer value that's equal to the scale factor applied to the maximum. We have some absolute minimum. We have, a, we have an implementation, right? So scaled minimum, we're going to give it a scale factor, which is a unit float. I don't know what that is. Um, Oh, okay, equal. We just have an implementation of equals. Okay. And then scale timer minimum, a class that describes how to compute a minimum timeout given a maximum timeout value. Hmm. It wraps scale minimum and absolute minimum and provides a single compute minimum method. And we can compute the minimum value for a given maximum timeout if this object was constructed, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Do we get to see what's... Okay, so we compute minimum. We've got a visitor and the visitor takes a value. We've got operator uh, parentheses, I guess, so you can call it. And it's going to call standard chrono duration cast on the time in milliseconds and multiply that, I guess, by the scale factor or something. I don't know why we're doing any of this. I guess uh, because it makes something easier. Okay. Something about allowing you to compute minimum, what is it, minimum timeouts given a maximum timeout. 
So um, so Karen's saying, I've been using Rust on side projects. Yes, it is a great type system. And especially Enums and Rust are great. Yeah, I want to I wanna try it. Um, we've looked at, I think we've looked at exactly one Rust project, which is the Rust, the Rust LSP uh, or Rust Analyzer uh, code base. But it seems Rust seems Rust seems really cool. We have scaled uh, range timer manager, creating timer objects that can be adjusted towards either the minimum or maximum of the range by the owner of the managing object. Hmm. So maybe if this is similar to scales the, to the thing we just looked at. Then um, maybe this is a way of of nudging things toward. I guess nudging the timeouts and stuff as you're applying filters. Like if, if things are changing in priority, maybe one of the, one of the things the filter is doing is um, indicating priority by taking like a higher priority message and um, making it think that it's, <laughs> that it's time is coming sooner or a lower priority message and making it think that it's time is that it has more time left or something like that. Here's the matcher thing. Matcher, matcher header. This file describes a matcher tree, which traverses a tree of matches till either matches, resulting in an, either in an action or a new tree to traverse or doesn't match. The matching might stop early if either the data is not available at all or if more data might result in a match. Uh, I'm wondering like what this means. So is this like a, tr um, like a prefix tree sort of thing? In cases where the data to match on becomes available over time, this would be fed into the data type over time, allowing matches to be reattempted as more data is available. As such, whenever we extract data from an input from data input, we make a note of whether data might change and pause matching until we either match or have all the data. Okay, I think we'll have to look at the in, the implementation to see what this is really doing. But it's something about matches and trees, and you can resume matches, and you might do more matching as you add more data. Um, we have an action which provides the interface for actions to perform when a match occurs. It provides no functions as implementers are expected to downcast this to a more specific action. Okay. And we have a type URL, which is the underlying type of this action. And you can get a typed version, which is a helper to convert it to its underlying type. And we have an actor, action factory context, which I guess will go in whatever the factory registry is, perhaps. And you can initiate, instantiate a nested matcher subtree for it, uh, or an action, maybe for an action. And the match state is either unable to match or a match complete. And unable to match means the match could not be completed, for example, due to required data not being available. So I guess unable to match means you might still be able to match later. And then here's the actual, I guess, class, which is templated by the data type. And what else? We have an input matcher, provides the interface for determining whether or not an input value matches. And we've got a factory for registering the custom input matchers. So I, yeah, I think, um, I think I want to see the implementation of this. Common protocol uh, format. Okay. Here's filter state. Stream sharing may impact pooling is the name of this class. Objects stored in the filter state can optionally be shared between the upstream and downstream filter state. Okay. Upstream is maybe the filters that came before you and downstream are the filters that come after you. Note that sharing happens at the connection level and in some cases may significantly reduce performance by preventing pooling of multiple downstream requests to a single upstream connection. Okay, so there's some um, sharing may impact pool. So this this enum name, I guess, is a war is a warning. Which is kind of interesting. In the filter state, uh, so you have a type read only or mutable. What else do we have? We have some lifespan which is either maybe the lifespan of the filter chain, lifespan of the request, the connection, 
whatever top span is. And request means request is longer than filter chain. When internal redirect is enabled, one downstream request may create multiple filter chains. Request allows an object to survive across filter chains for bookkeeping needs. Okay, so this is just kind of like lifetime um, the stuff. It can set data. And it takes a data name, a shared pointer to some object, by which the data, the state type, the lifespan, and stream sharing. As data or above lifespan. Okay. I feel like I'm getting a general picture, um, but still not not totally um, seeing how they're doing things. And I think that's that a lot of that will be cleared up if if and when we get to the the implementation files. Here's stream info. Um, and I guess I'll, does anyone else? Um, if anyone else is on the chat, uh, do you guys have a favorite language? Okay, so um, here is stream info. We have response flag, stuff about routing. Is this all? Uh, fault injection. So you, I guess you can inject fault. You can just, uh, whether things were rate limited. So these are these are flags. These are flags. I guess you can change. Um, I guess essentially metadata or information about the responses. And we have small response code detail values, as such as like if the response code was set by upstream, the requested payload was too large, the request was rejected because it's missing host. Okay, so all this is, is pretty interesting. Um, this is stream info.h. We have downstream timing, upstream timing. Okay, I'll try to move a little bit faster through these headers now. Thread local should just be data. That's thread local. Now we have a type slot. Set thread local data on all threads previously registered. We have a slot al allocator. Interface used to allocate thread local slots. Cool. And we can call run on all threads. And whether we're shut down, etc. Okay, here's hot restart header. We have a struct of server stats from parent and an admin shutdown response. We can drain parent listeners, shut down listeners in the parent process if applicable. Listeners will begin draining to clear out old connections. So parent makes me think that maybe you've just been forked. Is, is, that, uh, is that what this means? Um, we can duplicate parent listener socket, receive a listening socket on the specified address from the parent process. The socket will be duplicated across process boundaries. You can initialize, initialize the parent logic of our restarter meant to be called after initialization of a new child has begun. Yeah, I think we're basically forking. I mean, maybe the parent survives the child. Shut down, sorry, the, the child survives the parent. Shut down admin processing in the parent process if applicable. Send parent terminate request. Tell our parent processes to gracefully terminate themselves. <laughs> okay, yeah, huh. And we can retrieve stats from the parents. All right. This is maybe not, not so mysterious. So hot restart seems like it just basically works by um, creating a child process that survives the parents. And we send, we're sending the child everything we can. And then the parent is going to die gracefully, which is a little bit, a little bit sad when put in those terms. Um, all right. And whatever, I don't know what watchdog is. Watchdog objects are an individual thread's interface with the deadlock guard dog. So something that prevents deadlock, a shared pointer to a watchdog is obtained from the guard dog at thread startup. So when you start a thread, the guard dog is going to give you a watchdog pointer, a shared pointer to watchdog. After this point, the touch method must be called periodically to avoid triggering the deadlock detector. So we've got some shared pointer and we're basically going to do heartbeat just like we saw in Kubernetes, except instead of heartbeating information to some external database, we're going to touch a pointer. And if we don't touch it often enough, 
the deadlock detector, I guess, will decide that we've died and probably kill the thread or process or whatever we're dealing with. I think a thread, right? Thread, yeah. So touch. Manually indicate that you are still alive by calling this. Okay. When the watchdog is registered with the dispatcher, the dispatcher will per periodically call this method to indicate the thread is still alive. It should be called directly by the application code in cases where the watchdog is not registered with the dispatcher. Okay, so if you're not registering with the dispatcher, you got to do it yourself. Here's worker. Um, interface for threaded connection handling worker. You can do things like add listeners, uh, get the number of connections, initialize stats, stop, remove filter chains, etc., and then create worker. Okay, so that's not so exciting. Here's guard dog in that it just creates the watchdogs for the pointers you have to touch periodically. Drain manager. And create a child manager. Create a child drain manager. We'll proxy the drain status from the parent, but can also be used to enact local draining. Child managers can be used to construct drain trees. A drain tree. For each node in the drain tree can drain independently of its parent's node, but the drain status cascades the child nodes. Okay. A notable dis difference to drain callbacks is that the child managers are notified immediately and without delay timing. Additionally, notifications from parent to child is a thread safe operation, whereas callback registration and triggering is not. Hmm. Okay, so we got some sort of cascading drain situation. You can start a drain sequence, invoke to begin the drain procedure. The parameters of it, okay. You can set start parent shutdown sequence invoked in the newly launched primary process to begin the parent shutdown sequence. At the end of the sequence, the previous primary process will be terminated. All right, and then here's admin. And what can admin do? Admin stream. Set end stream on complete. Add on destroy callback. Get decoder filter callbacks on request body. I'm not sure what really admin is doing. Global admin HTTP point, HTTP point for the server. Okay, so this would be for administering the Envoy proxy itself, I, I guess. Holding a map from URL prefixes to handlers. When an HTTP request arrives at the admin port, the URL is linearly prefix matched against an ordered set of handlers. Linearly, I guess linear search. When a match is found, the handler is used to generate a request. Requests are capable of streaming out content to the client. However, most requests are delivered all at once. The implementation supplies adapters for simplifying the creation of streaming requests based on a simple callback that takes a URL and generates response headers in response body. Okay, the taxonomy of major types involved may help clarify. Request, a class holding a state for streaming admin content to clients. These are recreated on each request, a handler, is a class that holds context for family of admin requests, supplying one-shot callbacks for non-streamed responses, and admin holds the ordered list of handlers to be prefix matched. So this seems to be like the maybe the control plane, some control plane stuff for um, for Envoy. Let's maybe look up Envoy admin. Yeah, uh, so I'm being asked to explain the overall architecture and how all this glues together roughly. I can try now that I have seen a little bit of it. Um, but before I get to that, let me look at this um, admin interface thing. The optional admin interface provided by Envoy allows you to view configuration and statistics, change the behavior of the server, and tap traffic according to specific filter rules. Yeah, so it's some admin face, some admin interface. Okay, so how all this together um and i think we looked at hot restart let me try maybe let maybe pulling up the docs oops docs architecture overview is probably where i want to be um can i get a diagram The threading model is interesting, um, but maybe that's not what we want. The terminology.
let's try uh, looking for an image in whatever the Envoy site is. Envoyproxy.io. Here's Envoy Hot Restart. Is hot restart again. Um, I'm not seeing a great diagram, but um, how all this works? <laughs> sure, I'll look at that. Um, maybe could you leave a would, could you leave a comment um, so uh, so that I so that I remember and don't forget Dan and Jay. Um, so my understanding uh, of how Envoy works is uh, you're going to place it in front of. Um, let's say that you're using it in a in a container like environment, it's going to be the first, the, um, when somebody makes a request to the container, Envoy is going to be the first thing that's hit. And depending on how you've configured Envoy, um, it's the, the request is going to pass through a bunch of filters and, um, and just to give an example, what are those filters for, let's, let's say that you have a gRPC, you want to implement a gRPC service, um, cause it's a little bit nicer to work with gRPC in my opinion but then you want to expose a REST service. So one thing you can do is you can have um, an Envoy filter that will take in a REST request um, sent by some REST client and uh, transform that request to, to gRPC. Um, so taking the JSON, turning it into protobufs and, um, and doing whatever else is necessary, like taking the bearer token, moving it into the appropriate gRPC context um, and, uh, and, um, and so, so that's one sort of filter. And then when it's done, whatever filtering it's going to do, it's going to send the request, um, out of Envoy and into your, and into your, um, actual application. And Dan and Jay is asking, um, doesn't it work on all on level four and level seven OSI models? Yes, it does. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure how far down it goes. Um, so this is L7, but I think, yeah, here we go. This is what I want. Um, L3, L4 filter architecture. At its core, Envoy is an L3, L4 network proxy. A pluggable filter chain mechanism allows filters to be written to perform different TCP, UDP proxy tasks and inserted into the main server. Filters have already been written to support various tasks such as raw TCP proxy, UDP proxy, HTTP proxy, TLS, uh, client certificate authentication, TLS client certificate. So I guess that's like the client side of MTLS. Redis, MongoDB, Postgres, etc. Then there's an HTTP L7 filter architecture. And we have first class HTTP2 support. So it's used for both, for L3, L4, and then L7, um, which I think was basically your, your question. I know you can, and so Dan and Jay is saying, I know you can configure Nginx to act as, as at level four as well as L7. As level seven. Yeah, I think that's right. So, um, and then the thing that uh, I think the thing that makes Envoy different from something like Nginx is for a while, I think Nginx didn't have HTTP2, native HTTP2 support. I think they do now. Um, and then uh, the Envoy is more, um, more tuned for like a microservices kind of environment. Um, I'm not sure enough about the details about uh, of what um, how it's. I don't know enough about Nginx to know how Envoy is is different. So I don't want to say that Nginx can't do this or it's not so good at that, because the truth is I, I don't know. But um, but it's more it's more uh, optimized or designed for its design requirements are really around its use case as this kind of sidecar proxy. 
Um, whereas Nginx is more, I think it was designed to be used more as a either, um, I don't know if it was designed to be a reverse proxy or if it was just designed to be like a server. And just for fun, let's find this out. Do you think Wikipedia will tell me? Features. History. Okay. So Nginx from 2002 to solve the C10K problem. Okay, so I think this is like, um, Nginx's original contribution was, was basically to, instead of having one thread per uh, connection, to have this kind of asynchronous programming model where you can handle larger numbers of threads. It's a problem of optimizing network sockets to handle a large number of clients at the same time. We're concurrently handling 10,000 connections. Yeah, okay. And what does Wikipedia call Nginx? A web server that can also be used as a reverse proxy or load balancer. And so um, I think Envoy is primarily um, a proxy. You could probably use it as, a, as like a reverse proxy in the sense that it has like multiple backends. But a lot of the cases where you see it being used is it's like a single proxy for a single um, application. The Kraken D. I don't know about Kraken D. Envoy is more like an API gateway. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. Like, I think that um, all of these things, like, it kind of depends on how you def how you design your your API gateway or your, or your load balancer. But you do use um, like what's it called? Cloud endpoints. I think uses Envoy these days. Let's see if this is. Oh no, it uses Nginx. Well, well, never mind that. What does ESPV do? Is ESPV2 based on Nginx? Yeah. Oh, okay, wait, hang on. The next generation of ESP, instead of an Nginx-based data plane, ESPV2 uses Envoy. So it seems like, so ESP, ESP is this Google product, which you may not have heard of, but I have heard of it. And I, there's a, there's kind of an internal version, um, which is the extensible service pro proxy, which enables things like API management capabilities, including things like JSON to, to gRPC translation. So um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by a, API gateway. I've seen different offerings use that, use that term. So, um, but I think this is maybe one of the things that you would, that you might consider as as uh, similar in vain to some of that stuff. And it looks like they started using, they may have started using um, Nginx maybe in the first version, but then switched to Envoy or something. So it seems like Envoy and Nginx are kind of in the same space. As they add more features, they're going to continue kind of converging in um, in behavior. I know a pass service. So Dan J says, I know a pass service similar to Heroku, which uses Envoy Railway app. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, let me see if ChatGPT will let me log in. Hang on here. Let me just do this in case. Um, Okay. All right, never mind ChatGPT. All right. Um, so let me ask Bard um, compare and contrast Envoy and Nginx. I'm sure there's like a billion blog posts on it. They're both web servers and reverse proxies, but they have different strengths and weaknesses. Envoy is a relatively new project from Google, which it's not. It's from, I mean, Google might be involved. So I don't know if Google is actually involved in, I mean, they're involved in tons of stuff. They support tons of stuff. This is created by, I think my CSS is uh, created by Lyft. Yeah. All right. I'm not sure that this is the way that I would phrase this. It's not a new project from Google. <laughs> it's designed for, 
Okay, it's highly scalable, performant, and supports a wide range of features. Nginx is a more mature project that has been around for years. Stability and performance used for high traffic environments. However, Nginx's documentation is not as comprehensive. Here's a table. Envoy is highly scalable, while Nginx is just scalable. <laughs> Envoy is highly performant, while Nginx is just performant. Everything supports a wide range of, range of features. They, it seems like they like the Envoy documentation better. And it says, Nginx has a smaller community of developers, which doesn't sound quite right. Um, um, but uh, that's, what, that's what Bard says. And then Dan and Jay is asking, am I planning to conduct a coding se section where I would try to replicate a small feature from a particular application source code? Uh, I am planning to do coding. Um, hopefully starting next week, uh, replicate a small feature. I don't know if I'm planning to replicate anything. Um, I think I'm just gonna be building stuff from scratch, but I will be building it basically in the style of, of, um, how a bunch of this stuff, how a bunch of this stuff works. So, um, in like a microservice -y way. <laughs> yeah, I think those comparisons are probably nonsense. I wouldn't take I wouldn't take Bard too seriously. <laughs> it also th it also thinks that Google created uh yeah so, um, it's just better Nginx. That's what it's trying to tell me. This is Karen. Yeah. Uh, it also says Google created Envoy, which is not true. So who knows what Bard is thinking? Oops. Okay, so I'm in Emacs now. I opened, um, or rather, I marked a ton of files. Are my marks still here? Maybe in source, server. Yeah, can I do find? Read to read find. There's some way to open all of these. Do I know Lisp? Uh, no, I don't know Lisp. Lisp is not that hard to read because, um, it's like it's like functional and it's got a um, like the f the function name is like the first argument, but I don't know how to write it. See if I can um, open all marked files. I'm not going to write a new function to do it. Cat marked files. I'm not sure this is possible. Okay. I swear that I did this like yesterday, but I don't, I don't remember like what the command was. Oh, well, let me ask Bard. Can I open all marked uh, dured files in Emacs with a command? Bard says that it doesn't know programming. Dured do, oh, I had to, I had to add do. Let's try that. I think it's going to open way too many files in the same buffer or the same um, frame is what it's going to do, though. Do find marked files. All right. I guess it's not going to let me do that. Do I need to be in DuradX? Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm going to unmark guard dog implementation because it, it's kind of clear how that works. 
Um, listener hooks in server.c. Let's look at some of this hot restart stuff. Uh, what? I don't have proto buff mode apparently. Okay, so we have a hot restart message, which includes a past listen socket with an address in our worker index. I guess we're passing the listener listening socket. A shutdown admin message, which is empty stats, drain listeners, terminate. And then a request, which is a union of whether the whether to pass the listening socket, whether to shut down the admin or stats or or drain listeners or, or terminate. And then we get a reply. I guess um, if we've asked to pass the listen socket, then um, uh, we the 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 parent or whoever will will reply back with the file descriptor. I don't know why these things are inside of a reply rather than being their own messages. That seems a bit unconventional. I'm not sure if that's some sort of optimization. I don't know really how it would be, but uh, that's a thing. Um, and then shut down, I guess you can pass, it'll pass the original start time. Well, I don't really know what span is for. It can, I guess you can, it'll send you back stats, including things like counters and gauges and dynamics. Okay. Um, all right. So that's the proto. I don't, I guess we don't need to look at no op. Let's look at the implementation header. We've got shared memory, which is a shared memory segment. This structure is laid directly into shared memory and is used amongst all running envoy processes. So we're just gonna take the struct, I guess, and put it in shared memory which has a size of version, a log lock, an access log lock, and flags. All right. We can initialize the shared memory. We can initialize the mutex, the pthread mutex for process shared locking. So most of the, the Envoy stuff um, doesn't use locks, but it does use locks to access the shared memory. By not using locks, I mean like the filtering, the filtering logic is all, um, is all just done like parallel asynchronous processing without locks. But, uh, but obviously for shared memory, you, you do need locks. And we've got more abcell stuff, this exclusive lock function. You can process shared mutex, which is an implementation of basic lockable that operates on a process shared pthread mutex. Okay. And how do we start implementation built for Linux? Most of the protocol type logic is split out into hot restarting base parent child. And this class ties all that to shared memory and version logic. So you're gonna take a base ID, a restart epic, a socket path and a socket mode. Now you can drain the parent listeners, duplicate parent listeners, initialize and all that stuff. Cool. Okay, what else do we have? Oops. I see. The problem I was having before is that God mode is interfering with Dured mode. Okay. Restarting base. Do I care about restarting base? Logic shared by implementations of both sides of the, the, chair, the child parent hot restart protocol. So you can send hot restart message. In each direction between parent and child, a series of pairs of UN64 length followed by length. Uh, I guess bytes are the appropriate length. Each new message start in a new send message datagram. So send message, um, is that a socket thing? I think that might be the socket thing. And probably we're just using sockets of, of local hosts, it, like AF Unix or AF local or whatever that's called. Okay, whether it's blocking, get past file descriptor. Okay, so this is the, this is that stuff. I guess I feel like I understand what's going on here. So I'm not going to really dig too much deeper, but I guess I'll look at parent H. Uh, how, actually, let's look at the parent um, implementation. 
when we initialize, we call dispatcher create file event. And we, we were passed in the, the dispatcher and we were passed in a server. And we we're going to call my domain socket, which I guess knows about its own socket. And we have this thing that kind of looks like a lambda. And then we're going to call make unique internal of server. So we're going to make a unique pointer to, to, our, to the server that was passed in. I mean, we've taken ownership of it. I'm not sure uh, entirely what's going on there. And then on socket event, maybe this is message handling. You get like, we're looking for messages, request case, like, uh, and the case is things like pass list and socket, the stuff we sell in the protocol buffers. Get list and sockets for child. Um, Resolve a URL. Oh, okay. To get, I guess to get to get the sockets for that URL, I'm going to iterate over listeners and iterate over more listeners in some inner loop. Check the socket local address. Do some stuff. Check the socket type. And I guess ultimately return wrapped reply. So we're going to take wrapped reply, immutable reply, and we're going to set the FD with this list and socket stuff. Can I explain how atomics and different orderings work? Um, did we see atomics? Um, maybe, can you, would you mind clarifying what you mean by different orderings? Um, atomics should basically be, I think atomics are typically, um, part of the like CPU architecture, um, atomic instructions, primitive atomic instructions, Atom uh, processors have instructions that can be used to implement locking and lock free and wait-free algorithms. The ability to temporarily inhibit interrupts, ensuring that the currently running process cannot be context switched, also suffices on a unit processor. These instructions are used directly by compiler and operating system writers, but are also abstracted and exposed as bytecodes and library functions for higher level languages. And we have things like atomic read-write. Um, so the, the idea of atomics, so basically what's the, what, what's the point of pulling this up is that um, at least my understanding is that atomics are part of the, where are we? We're in linear, linear, all right, blah, 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 linearizability, um, that they're part of the processor. So like X, you know, Intel will build atomics into its system and then they'll be exposed. But things like read, write. So you'd like to read something from a register, I guess, and write to, write to another register. But you want to know that the thing you're, you know, um, when you, the thing you're going to write is dependent on the thing you're going to read. So you want to know that um, between when you read it and when you write it, other stuff hasn't happened on the processor that makes your assumptions invalid. And so you want to do that atomically. Um, and so it's just a way of, of the processor providing guarantees for, um, for operations that, that, that really need to know that, um, that their assumptions are valid. And a similar thing is test and set. Um, which is used to write or set one to a memory location and return its old value as a single atomic operation. The caller can then test the results to see if the state was changed by the call. Um, and I guess the issue here is there might be a race, race condition <laughs> where you write one and then something else writes a zero or, or whatever. Um, and so you want the, the test and set to happen atomically. So just basically preventing race conditions from messing up what you're trying to do. Uh, does that answer the question about atomics? And then I'm not sure about the different orderings. I, I don't know what context, um, there's a delay in the chat. So I don't remember quite what I was looking at when you, when you asked that question.
and while you're um while you're thinking that up let me uh i'll i'll, I'll move on to listener hooks so these are hooks in the server to allow for integration testing the real server just uses an empty implementation defined below okay so this is for implementation testing but this is just things like on listener added and stuff like that that's that's not interesting primitive ordering they were in shared memory struct okay where do we see shared memory was that hot restart implementation struct shared memory okay so we did we see atomic here yeah Okay, I don't the yeah, um, atomic flags. I guess I don't know what an atomic UN64 is, so let's ask that. And then you're asking about primitive orderings. Did the um let me try I don't think I see where um, where you're seeing primitive ordering. We so we have si shared memory structure. We have size version log log access log log, and then this these flags. Um, and then what else? We we saw some stuff with mutexes. I'm. Then what else did we look at? We looked at um, the base and network order. So, oh, so maybe maybe we saw something about network ordering. Um, so there's a uh, this this is I think probably um, endianness. Release ordering. Let me find um, all occurrences of order in here. And um, in network order, run network order. Oh, OK. There are different ways of using atomics behavior. OK. That I don't know. But I can look it up. So primitive um, atomics and memory ordering. Oh, I see. Okay. Atomic primitive in the, in the so something about the order of memory. The order of arguments has been reversed. C11 has the address of the atomic value first and the value. That's, I think, not the kind of ordering you're, you're asking about. But I did see some stuff about here, memory ordering. As you can see, atomic objects have methods to or load and are used for reading and writing. I'm not sure. I think it's something about um, memory order can be specified using the following enumeration. I, I don't know, but I will ask Bard, and I think it's just probably something around um, if you're using atomics, then things like the, you know, you don't want the way that things are ordered to, to mess mess things up. And there may be some subtlety around that. Um, how are atomic operations impacted by um, ordering? Maybe memory ordering? Uh, and then you mentioned release ordering. Let's see if we can find release ordering. A store operation with this memory order performance release operation. No reads or writes in the current thread. Is this the sort of thing you mean, memory order? Order release. Okay. 
No reads or writes in the current thread can be reordered after the store. Okay, so um, in general, like compilers can do things like reorder your code. So if a, um, if a compiler writer, or I think in some cases the processor, um, believes that they can, uh, you know, you write, you write some for loop, like if this is true, do some other stuff. I mean, that has a, that has an explicit order to it. Um, but the compiler and possibly also the processor, I'm not sure, can decide to change the order from the order you wrote. If it can prove that those things, um, if it can prove, prove that the reordered version and your version have the same behavior. And so in general, what you write is not the same as, is, is not the same as what's executed. And I think that what this is saying is that, um, this is a, this is a way in C++ to say like, don't reorder this section. I've thought through the order and it's either critical for performance or behavior. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm not, I'm not positive, <laughs> but, but that, that's, that I think is what's, what's going on with this. Um, so Bart is saying the atomic operations are impacted by memory ordering in the following way. Sequential consistency. This is the strongest memory ordering model. So it guarantees that all memory operations are seen by all threads in the same order as if they were executed sequ sequentially. Okay. Acquire and release. These memory ordering models guarantee that memory operations are seen by other threads in the order in which they are performed. Acquired operations guarantee that all memory operations that precede them are visible to other threads and release operations guarantee that all memory operations that follow them are not visible to other threads. And relax, this is the weakest form. It does not guarantee any ordering. Yeah, so that, I mean, maybe relax is the right way to think. Like in general, uh, you in general, you don't have to care. Some people care some of the time for certain parts of the code and um, since most people don't need to care in general, everything's kind of optimized for the case where you don't need to care and there are no real guarantees. And then if you do need to care, there are ways of saying, whoa, now uh, I need these guarantees. And the, the, the compiler and the processor should, should respect that. All right. Um, okay. Let's see. So I don't even remember where I was. Let's look at drain manager. And I think I want the, the CC file. We can create a child manager. And what's it going to do? It's going to call make unique on this drain manager implementation with the server, I guess. The, no, where's this? the server is, I guess we, uh, it's something we already have is cause it's got an underscore on it. And, but you're going to give the create child manager a dispatcher and a drain type. And it's going to add the dispatcher to your children, wire up the child so that the parent, so when the parent starts draining, the child also sees the state change. Okay. And then we're going to, I guess, move the child call back to the child object thingy and then return child. And drain close. If we're actively, uh, we are actively health check failed and the drain type is default, always drain close. So I guess that that's this condition. If we're not draining, we're going to return false. So I guess drain close can only be called if it's already draining. And if the drain strategy, strategy is immediate, we're going to return true. And then if we're, it's not immediate, we're going to assert that the drain strategy is gradual. And we've got this um, time, which is monotonic time. Since we're discussing ordering, uh, we should also, I guess, mention that clocks don't always go forward in computers. They could sometimes go backwards. And I, I'm guessing monotonic, monotonic time is a, is a timer that's guaranteed to always go forward. Um, and then we compare our current time to the, to the drain deadline. And if we're at, on the deadline, we return true. Otherwise, we get the remaining time by doing some computation with Chrono. Um, and we assert that um, just a sanity check that drain time is bigger than remaining time. Then we get the elapsed time by subtracting remaining time from drain time. And then we're going to return essentially the 
lapse time count is bigger than some random gen some random number generator modulo the drain time count. I guess um what is this doing? It's gonna return bull. I don't know what this random thing is doing. I'm not sure if this is prevent if this is um why are we taking a random number? So whatever it, it returns a boolean, but it, this this boolean seems to have some probabilistic behavior. And uh I'm not sure if that's um to adjust for the fact that um i'm not sure if this is to adjust for some other non-deterministic behavior um so like maybe there's some some funniness with the clocks or, or elapsed time count or it could be that um we only want to sometimes return true uh it's like a rate limiting thing, or there could be some other reason. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure exactly why we have this random number, random number thing here. That, that's interesting. If you know why, why that's there, then let me know. Maybe this tells me, or maybe the header tells me. Let's try. Can I jump to? Uh, All right. Let's look at see if we can find the Jane Close header. Drain decision. So maybe the maybe it's making a decision and uh the randomness is because in general it's better to have the randomness in, in making that decision in the in the you know in the long run over many runs of envoy. That's possibly the right thing to do. We have callbacks that we can add for if the drain is closed or when the drain is complete. And we start the drain sequence. We check if we're draining. And we, I guess, add a callback. And then we do some asserting. Uh, we say that we're draining set by setting draining to two. We're going to call, run callbacks on the children. A signal to child drain managers to start their drain sequence. Okay, so whoever our children is, they should start draining too. Then we'll schedule a callback to run at the end of drain time. And then we'll have this timer and ticker stuff. We'll get the current time and the remaining time and do some more time stuff. And then we'll have this callback thing, which we run with delay. Where do we actually do the draining? Maybe the maybe the actual like handling of 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 drain connections is in the callbacks. Run callbacks with Yeah, I'm not sure. Then we've got the I mean and this also might be part of the the parent child handoff, right? It's explained in the implementation comment. Is it? Is it the note? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I guess I just read it. Didn't read this. Call register on. Uh, is this the right thing? What was I looking at? Drain close or something? Is this, is this what you're talking about? In relation to Exxon Boy immediate health check fail, it would be better. This is about health check failure, right? Period of drain ramp up. Uh, is this for is it to support drain ramp up? Is that the idea? I don't think that, that doesn't sound quite right. Oh, okay. Probably. Oh, yeah. Here we go. All right. This is the comment. I mean. The probability that we will return true. Is equal to the elapsed time over the drain timeout. If the drain deadline is succeeded, 
then we'll skip the probability calculation equal to the elapsed time over drain timeout. Okay. But why is that useful? Why not just return the probability rather than returning true um, probabilistically? Some function is going to look at this function and let's find occurrences of drain closed. Whoops. I think I just edited the file. Did the drain close like that? So we've got tests that are calling expect true on drain close. Return is draining. Drain decision, drain close. Connection manager. Check if this host is draining. Similarly to above, the response is buffered until transported. I'm not sure. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter that much. I'm just kind of curious. I guess we could try, um, we could try blaming it. Actually, that's not what I want. I want the, the line that adds the, um, All right, this line. Uh, remove random generator from everywhere except API. Make probabilistic drain configurable. Okay. Oh, okay, so, oh, I see. So it's not, um, it's probabilistically draining. It's not probabilistically, yeah, okay. That makes more sense. So it's not, um, I see. So drain closes is, is, is telling you the truth about whether um, whether it's draining, I guess. Um, it's not, there's not some truth about draining that it's probabilis probabilistically lying to you about. Instead, um, this is the truth about draining, whether or not this function returns true or false. And, um, and it's, um, it's probabilistic because the, the decision is, is probabilistic. So maybe I'm, I think I'm just confused about the name of this function. So I think that what I said is is right. That would make a lot more sense than um, it like probabilistically telling you a lie. Um, okay. So this is more drain stuff. Um, I guess the the actual draining is. I'm not sure. Uh, I should do things like stop accepting connections. And if you're draining, you're probably shutting down. So it's probably handing off existing sockets to, to the child. So I'm not totally convinced that we, um, that we understand draining, but I think we kind of understand enough to, um, to move on and we're about to, and so I don't want to spend too long here. Here's server.h. This looks like a, a main en entry point. Um, we get things like compilation settings, all server compilation setting stats. So this is, uh, maybe, um, pretty high level. We've got lots of counters, histograms, essentially metrics, uh, and wow, tons of variables. Like uh, it's got a dispatcher, an SSL context manager. This is kind of like a God class, it seems like. 
Um, but it's really just like a uh, like a container of all the state, I guess. Mute text tracer, just all of the things. Server instance. Okay, so that seems to be what server is. I'm um, I'm too scared to look any any closer. Watchdog implementation is not so interesting because uh, they're just gonna have the touch. It's just gonna period periodically call touch. Worker implementation. Actually, let's look at the header first. We got some, and it's the server threaded worker that wraps up a worker thread, event loop, etc. And it's going to do things like manage the listeners. To start with a guard dog, initialize stats, stop, and thread routine. We look at thread routine. All one word. I apparently can't spell it. Routine. There you go. Okay, so third routine takes the guard dog and a callback function. It's going to log some stuff. It's going to post some stuff to the dispatcher. This watch the watchdog must be created after the dispatcher starts running and has it has post events flushed. As this is when TLS stat scopes start working. Then we're going to call it run on the dispatcher with the blocking type. And if we leave, then we've done running the dispatch loop. Okay, so the real work is being done by the dispatcher. The dispatcher is running the event loop and we're and the, 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 the thread routine function is blocking on that event loop. So once we've left this function, we're just shutting down. And then where's the dispatcher? The dispatcher is an event dispatcher, which is not owned. This is the guard dogs dispatcher. And here's the abstract uh, dispatcher, which I think we might've looked at. Yeah, you can create things like timers. And run. Cool. Maybe we can find um, some specific type of dispatcher that, it, that, that, that has an implementation. But it's not here. And where else did we go? I think admin. We're going to ignore. In fact, everything in admin, I'm just going to totally ignore. Because I'm not so interested in the admin. Um, the admin uh, endpoint implementation. Common. Do we see seven extensions? Let's see. Source, I think we, um, we, I think we saw everything in server. And admin. We found some stuff, including cluster proto. So let's look at that stuff. I think that was it. Config validation, I decided I'm not interested in. Uh, I think I closed the find stuff. So this this config directory just has um, like a proto proto data. Where's my Envoy service cluster, more proto. I guess let's look at one of these proto files. So this is a this is a cluster directory service, which will return a list of all clusters this proxy will load balance to. So we can do load balancing. We have stream clusters, and delta clusters, and fetch clusters. Not sure where those are, and a CDS dummy. And it's going to return this discovery response. So we've got this, um, all of these discovery APIs are part of Envoy. 
Oh, sorry. Delta clusters and stream clusters and fetch clusters. I'm looking at a proto. So these are RPC messages. So I guess fetch clusters will fetch the clusters. And then we can see here um, this, and this option, Google API, HTTP. This is defining the REST interface based on the protocol buffer. So the um, presumably, if we're using protocol buffers, the real implementation is gRPC. But, but you can send REST to Envoy and um, it'll use the gRPC services and REST will presumably translate the, the proto buff, the, 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 the JSON messages into proto buffs, as I mentioned some, somewhere earlier in the stream. And I think that's about it. We're uh, about two hours in. Um, I don't know what else, I don't know enough about Envoy to know what else is gonna be super fascinating. Um, but I think we've seen it, you know, most of the guts. I guess let's do another pass just in case stats, stream info, TCP thread, tracing, UDP, and upstream. Yep. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to call it a day. That's Envoy. Um, it's kind of a, we don't have a sense of how, how you use it. There's actually a lot of great content out there about Envoy service messages, service meshes, why you might need them. Um, and I'll link in the in the show notes to uh, an ad, like a more advanced talk on the Envoy architecture that I thought was interesting. Uh, but in terms of understanding the code, the layout of the code, where stuff is, what sorts of objects do people work with when they're working with Envoy? I think we got a, a pretty good sense of that. So yesterday we did Kubernetes. Last week we did eBPF, and then tomorrow we're looking at Cilium, which is a an eBPF um, Kubernetes network plugin thing that um, I think over time will take on more and more duties from the Envoy like service meshes, and so we might see some similar patterns there, like there may be filters and stuff like that. But one of the things presumably Cilium is going to have to do is it's going to have to create these eBPF programs. And when we were looking at eBPF before, we saw like the validation, some of the validation logic um, and how the programs are translated from like eBPF bytecode into um, assembly through the just-in-time compiler and stuff like that. So that, that should be pretty interesting. And I hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>